eles vão é, fazer uma exposição rápida, né, de uns 10 minutos para cada uma, é, na ordem que os, que, os, que os acontecimentos aconteceram, tá certo? Começando pela Síria, depois a Espanha, depois os Estados Unidos, e, uh, e na sequência eles vão responder perguntas é, de vocês. Então tem bastante tempo para perguntas no final, tá? É, e aí eu vou pedir para vocês, na hora de fazer as perguntas, fazerem em português, mesmo que você fale inglês, mesmo que você fale espanhol, fazer a pergunta em português que vai ser traduzida, tá certo? Ok? Obrigado. Então, sem mais delongas, com vocês, Leila. Um, the password. Is this going to happen often? Okay, thank you. So, can you all hear me? Yes? Thank you all for being here. I'm honored to see you guys. And uh, I'm going to use this time to give a voice to people who don't always have the opportunity to be at these kind of meetings. Because uh, people in Syria right now are uh, facing extremely dramatic uh, situation, extremely dramatic attack against life, against freedom of expression. So repression of every form of opposition is brutal. So uh, it is not safe to leave the country and be in one of these conferences. So I don't live, I don't live in Syria, I live in Spain. I have Syrian family. So I'm going to use this opportunity to just share the voices of uh, some Syrian people that I wish could be here instead of me. So the presentation is called The Struggle for Freedom and the End of Silence. And this is uh, where you can find me. Please feel free to contact me on Twitter, on my email. I'll be glad to answer any questions or any issues uh, you're concerned about. So, for decades now, Syrian citizens have been dealing not only with a repressive regime, but with silence, with international silence. The Syrian regime of, uh, of uh, the Assad family that has been in power for, 40, for, for decades now, for four decades, has used media and silence to portray an image of a secular country where, uh, where uh, words like dictator were never applied to Syria. It was described as a republic, as a constitutional system, a republic. So the government has used the silence. Uh, journalists, international journalists, are not allowed in the country. Uh, the country owns the media within Syria. So we have not been able to see what was happening in Syria until now. But very recently, we have seen how citizens are recording their own contents, they're uploading their own videos. In Syria, in most of the Middle East, not everybody doesn't have an internet connection, but pretty much everybody has a cell phone. So using uh, their cell phones to record what's happening in real life time has turned very useful in a context where media cannot enter the country. So it's citizens performing a historic role, not only trying to change their country into a more democratic, into a more uh, respectful country of justice and freedom and dignity, but they have also started to tell their story, to narrate their story with their own tools. So we, I don't know how we could be seeing what's happening in Syria now without mobile phones and YouTube. Those are the only sources we have right now. So for, uh, for all this time, for all these decades, the government has been trying to silence every form of citizen expression. And Syrian citizens are very aware of this. So this is a picture taken at Kafir Nabel, a city in Syria that's become very creative and is showing very creative images of how they're uh, struggling against brutality. So what is this poster saying? Underneath we can see Kafir Nabel occupied city. 
but the rest of the paper is white, is blank, is nothing, because they are very aware that silence has played against them, that they have been silenced for so many years. So look at the bands on their mouths. They are very aware that silence is what has allowed this government to stay in power. So there's a video that I want to show you that proves how citizens have broken this wall of silence. There's this video that has gone viral where a young kid, because youth has played a crucial role in Syria, because the older generation was blocked, was mentally blocked, and they were so used to these repressive regimes that it, it took another generation to think that change was possible. So there's this video where a young kid, a teenager, tells someone else from what we call the silent majority, people who have not taken a stand yet, and is trying to tell him, we need you, your country needs you, we need you to break the wall of silence and speak against this government too. Subtitles are in Spanish. I don't know if we can hear. Is the sound working? Is the sound, el sonido? No. No funciona el sonido. Dale, a ver. No. No sound. Bueno, no pasa nada. Continuamos sin sonido. I really, there's always some technical problem. I'm going to entertain. Stop. Okay. Just for one moment, I'd like to ask a question. How many of you have heard of the Arab Spring or Occupy Wall Street? Okay. How many of you like campus party? Keep your hands up. Okay, so the right way to do that is to use both hands and to twinkle. Can you do that? Twinkle hands. You like campus party? Twinkle. All right. You like global protest movements? Twinkle. You want to show solidarity with global protest movements? Twinkle. Okay, so we're going to try this. This is just a test. We're going to come back to this, all right? So say after me, and the translator should stop right now. Say after me. All day, all week. Occupy Wall Street. Perfect. We're going to come back to that just as soon as we fix the sound. But let me ask, how many of you have participated? How many of you have participated in a demonstration in your country over the last few months. Okay, how many of you are doing it over economic injustice? Okay, how many are doing it over the rights of marginalized groups? How many of you are doing it against corruption? How many of you are involved in politics? Not so many, right? Yeah, there's a connection maybe. So. I'm just wondering who here can come up to the stage and talk about the protests that they've been part of. Come. 
Who's been part of a protest? In Brazil, who's been part? Come, come. Oh, the sound works? Keep in mind, if you haven't been to a protest, you will have homework to go and protest. What an entertainer, thank you. Okay, so we are not going to be able to see this video now. There's always some technical problem. So I really would uh, recommend you see this video. It's called, if you Google, what are you af afraid of, Syria? What are you afraid of, Syria? It's a very powerful video where a younger person tells some, some other person, what are you afraid of? Uh, the regime, okay, let's change it. What are you afraid of? Death. Well, is this life better than dying? So, so there's a lot of, uh, this, this video has gone viral and it's been very powerful. Okay, so the government has been silencing protesters. Protesters like Riyadh Matar. He was a young kid, like 23, 24 years old. And he was very active in the demonstrations in Daraya, in the neighborhood, one neighborhood of Damascus. So he was very well known for organizing demonstrations where they gave the soldiers flowers and water. So of course, this is the enemy for a government that is afraid of peaceful revolution, is afraid of non-violence. So they hunted him down, they tortured him to death, and they returned his body to his family. Riyad Matar, one of our Syrian heroes. So they've been silencing protesters, they've been silencing humor, okay? Because Arabs have this thing that in very stressful situations, they have to laugh. When things are so dramatic, they have this device that is laughing at themselves, laughing at their problems. So this is a cartoon by a very well-known cartoonist, Ali Ferzat, and he portrayed Gaddafi running out of the country, and this is Bashar al-Assad hitchhiking to take a ride with Gaddafi, wherever Gaddafi is going. So after, they, after this picture was published, they, uh, uh, Ali Ferzat was brutally beaten. He was left on the street with both his hands broken. So this is the metaphor in Syria. They break hands of the people who draw. They rip the vocal cords of people who sing against the regime. And they gouge the eyes out of journalists and video activists who are recording what's happening. This is the metaphors the regime uses to tell Syrians what happens if someone decides to speak or sing or write or draw against the regime. So they're silencing bloggers and journalists, of course. This is uh, our friend Razan Ghazawi, very prominent blogger. She was going to a conference on freedom of expression in Jordan and they stopped her and uh, arrested her for a few weeks. There was a huge uh, outcry and a global protest for her uh, release. So they released her soon after, but uh, many others have not been so lucky. And uh, Syria is very high in the, in the scale of, um, in, the, in the arrest of journalists and bloggers and everybody who is uh, uh, promoting freedom of expression in the country. So in spite of the attempts by the government, to silence every form of expression, the, the, ways, yeah, the way citizens have been using um, technology to express their voices, 
to share what is happening within the country has inspired global solidarity. We can all now sympathize with the Syrians. We can hear their stories. We can see their faces, which is something we did not have a few years ago. So there's a trend, I would say, not in governments. We don't expect so much from governments, but we do, uh, we are uh, very happy about the global citizen solidarity that we are witnessing with the Syrian struggle. So this is a video of an initiative that you can all join that's called Syrian Sitting on YouTube. So you can just send a video in solidarity with Syrians and these people will upload it. So you can read, oh, it's not working now. She's saying, I stand in solidarity with the Syrian people because this is a struggle for human rights and, uh, and it's a universal cause, okay? So there are more things we can do as global citizens now. We have more power to stand with each other. So just a few things that we can do and I encourage you to do is uh, find an organization in your community that sends help economic help to Syrian refugees in countries like Turkey. So many organizations are doing this. I belong to one in Spain, Asociación de Apoyo al Pueblo Sirio. We send economic aid and uh, products to refugees, so you can contact an organization in your community. Avaz is an organization that is sending mobile phones to Syrians to make sure that they can record what is happening and keep sharing it with the world. So if you go to Avaz and find this campaign, you can help Avaz help Syrians. You can demonstrate at Syrian embassy in your country because something activists are demanding is that the ambassadors are expelled of every democratic country. You can pressure your political representatives or Russia Russian political representatives and Chinese political representatives are the ones who are still supporting Syria, who are not helping isolate the regime. So maybe finding Medvedev on Twitter. This is his Twitter handle, Medvedev Russia, Russia E. And, uh, and uh, tweeting that you're in solidarity with the Syrian people. So I encourage those of you who are active on Twitter to do so, to protest the support of, uh, of a Syrian regime who is actively massacring its people for demanding peace and democracy and freedom. Blog about it, tweet about it, get mad, show that you're not indifferent, show you care, many things we can do now. And also, in general, sending a message of solidarity to Syrian activists, just a simple message on Twitter, free Syria, we support you. Sometimes this is more than you can imagine. It's more helpful than you can imagine when people are feeling so isolated and so left out and so abandoned by the world. So keep uh, aware that we are all part of the same global cause, that if we uh, let human rights suffer in a part of the world, we are all victims, we are all losing, we are all uh, uh, giving ways to repressive uh, practices to get bigger and, um, and repeat and reproduce themselves. And that's all, and uh, anything you, you need and anything you, you can contribute, we're more than welcome to, to have you contact us. Well, uh, thank you, Leila. It's impressive. And, uh, well, if I had to do something now, I would start tweeting Mendeleev and telling him what you think about what they are doing and what is their position on Syria. That, that's important. We can all contribute to that. I'm going to talk about the uh, M15 in Spain, but I'm not... I don't like to, to analyze it. I'm, uh, I'm not here to just, just to show it to you. I want you to either make your own M15, M, uh, May 15th, or collaborate with other people. And I'm going to tell you what are the things that have worked for us. 
how to build something that we call re-evolution. It's not a revolution, that's something outdated, that's something from the past, that uh, we want to, to build something completely new. We live in a, in a new world and let's build new things and let's keep evolving. Uh, this uh, presentation I will tweet uh, later on because there are many links that you can check, you can check afterwards. So uh, let's see uh, how how was built the uh, uh, in Spain and um, and let's now that we are around around gigs let's talk about uh, the resonance frequency. All objects, all structures have a resonance frequency. If you are able to tune in into the resonance frequency and send a wave and amplify that wave enough, you will be able to change the structure of that object. And the more rigid it is, the more you'll be able to change that structure. I'd like to think that social structures also have a resonance frequency. And also, there is a wave that you can amplify. And let's see how we did it in the Spanish case. We build a very simple message. Actually, in order to get to a very simple message, you have to work a lot with a lot of people in a very collaborative spirit. First of all, non-violence. Gandhi taught us that non-violence is a lot stronger than violence. Obviously, this is not, we are not playing in the same field as in Syria. The rules of that playing field are not set by the demonstrators. They are set by the one in power. Uh, Syria government is applying violence on their people. The Spanish government is very seldom does it. And once they try to do it, it has repercussions, and they don't want to keep doing it again. Second one is just people. We, we don't want big structures that we consider from the past as political parties or trade unions that, at least in Spain, they have not behaving as we would have liked. Maybe they have been behaving more on their own interest, and that might contam contaminate the whole movement. The third one is the it's collaborative and it's open. We learn from each other, we let everyone in, as long as when they come in, they take off their hats. If they are from a trade union, they are from a political party, that doesn't mean they cannot participate. It only means that whenever they enter an assembly, they take their hat off and start acting just as human beings, as citizens. And we launch this sentence, is we are not merchandise in the hands of political non-bankers. In order to understand that simple sentence, you have to understand a little bit, and I'm just going to go through it, the situation in Spain. This is the Spain that you know about, the Spain in the media. This you might know about, it is a 23% unemployment, and with our, there is crisis. We have 5 million people that are already unemployed. This you might not know about, this is the corruption in Spain. These are political candidates charged with corruption scandals that were on the list and you cannot get rid of them. If you vote for any of these political parties, you will choose a corrupt politician. There is a wiki that you can check and maybe you can apply it here too to show what is going on. And then there is the Spain that you will definitely not see. You will not see that Spanish uh, political parties their, their way, their finance is not transparent. The European Union came to Spain. They recommended about five years ago that they should change it. They came two years later and they said, no, they, you have not made any progress. If you don't know how your political parties are financed, how do you know who they represent? There are more than 300,000 foreclosures in Spain. Mass media is mostly controlled by, by politicians. Uh, justice is not independence. One out of two uh, young people in Spain right now are suffering unemployment and if you want to start a business we are according to the United Nations on how easy it is to start a business in Spain we rank in number 147 right after Congo plus the last one we have we are the second country with the largest number of mass graves after Cambodia when a judge tried to investigate on those crimes against humanity, now he was put in court. So the same judge that tried to investigate about it is the one who is being judged right now. That's the Spain that you don't see. 
And this is the Spain I would like you to see. Unfortunately, I don't have a lot of time. There are a lot of beautiful people, entrepreneurs, assemblies. There is an open network uh, of communication called WiFinet. You should definitely check it. Uh, the Cooperativa Integral, where people are not using money to trade goods and services, and it's just all of them together. And a lot of solidarity. Spain is a really beautiful place. So now we've seen the two sides of Spain, the side of Spain that you can see in the media and the other side. Now we have the frequency that we want to tune in. Now we have to amplify it. How do you amplify that frequency? First of all, networks of people. We are all a network. We have to get connected. You might not know the one who is sitting right next to you, but if you connect to them, maybe you have the same ideas. So Twitter networks, Facebook networks, blog networks, mostly internet networks. Why? Because they are cheap. It's cheap to build those networks. The second one is networks of networks. If you try to build an organization that is going to be just done by yourselves, by a large group of people, that can be okay. But connect yourself with other organizations. During the May 15 demonstration, more than 400 organizations, they signed the manifest that we built and they collaborated into breaking this, uh, this noise barrier. And the third one is the, the, the street marketing. Street marketing is great. I love it. But hold it. You have to do it a bit like Braveheart. Hold it, hold it, hold it. And once you want to push for it, do it all at once. Three days, one week before your big event is going to be. Do it all together. If not, it will never go uh, above the noise barrier that you want to go through. Once you break the noise barrier, then you be, the, the whole system changes. We could have never predicted, well, during uh, uh, the May 15 demonstration, there were more than 60 cities, probably more than almost a million people that somehow participated in the events. But then everything changed, and everything changed, and camps started to appear all around Spain. So once you break the noise, then something new is going to happen that you will not be able to control it, but you have defined at the DNA of the movement before, a non-violence movement, a collaborative movement, an open movement. Do not try to control it. It's going by itself. Define a good DNA, a real one, and let it go. Uh, all the things, this is a beautiful example. Do you see all those microphones and all those uh, televisions? That was after May 15th. Before May 15th, we did a press conference, and only three journalists appeared. From those three journalists, one published a little piece of it. After May 15th, we did a press conference to explain what was Democracia Real ya, the same one, and the room was packed. It was full, but be careful with the media. The second one is, well, you can see that image in the right, that it's, that's La Puerta del Sol. Uh, there were marches from all around Spain to Sol. Those marches later on went from Sol to Brussels together with the movement. And these are some, well, some little sentences that you might, you might consider when building those things. Be careful with the media and be careful with the leaders. Media can destroy you and will try to do it. Leaders, you have to be careful with them. If you rely very hardly on one person, if that person is not there anymore, maybe your movement won't work. Do what is legitimate, not necessarily what is legal. It has to be legitimate. It has to be supported by a large amount of people. Maybe there are laws that you are fighting against and you will have to go against those laws. Trust and respect the people you are working with. Keep planning, keep moving. You have to plan the situation and you have to keep moving. Do not just contribute, do not control, and share and keep the knowledge. This is something that, that we have problems with. Once we build a very open organization, you better have the knowledge inside the organization so even if people change, that knowledge is still within the group, and you maintain that knowledge. And there are different ways of doing that. Can this model be applied globally? The answer, it's not a theoretical answer. It's a real answer. It's yes. I've, I don't know if you participated in uh, October 15 demonstrations throughout the world. That was last year, about a 1,000 cities. 
and about 80 countries. This is not something that I'm just talking about. You, just, you, you can check the links, you can check the videos, you can check every little group that was there. And it's a group, it's a global movement of people. So make it global, but keep it personal. Because we, as individuals, are the ones that are contributing to this change. The, one of the last things I want you to talk about, to know, is the organizational structure we have. You have to make decisions. You can talk for hours, but after you talk for hours, you have to make a decision. What we do normally is assemblies, and we also use, use some other online methods to make those decisions. But, and maybe you will make mistakes. Still, make those decisions. If you don't make decisions, the movement won't keep growing. Then there are working groups. Anyone can have a working group. You just get a few people, and then you work on a specific issue. Coordination, three levels of coordination, the local one, the national one, and then what we have are nodes where from Spain there are trusted people, like I was participating in one of them. So once someone wants to contact someone in Brazil, there is someone I know in Brazil that knows a lot more of the people. And that one from Brazil knows me. So they can contact us to contact them in Brazil. If you give the contact directly to the guy in Brazil, then and they might met, get messed up, and they don't know if the other person is real or not, or what's the purpose. So you act as a way of saying, okay, things are going, and you just act as a communication channel. It's always open, anyone can communicate, you just provide the tools to do that. And communication, speakers. Uh, speakers on televisions, people that are managing the Twitters, accounts, people that are managing the Facebook. Those people have to rotate. Those people have to change. The psychological impact that it has for a person to be on TV for two weeks talking about the movement is huge. You have to care about that person. That's one of you. That's not suddenly someone famous that is up there. And that person has to rotate. So be careful with that. Uh, these are the platforms that we are using. And you will know about the, and, and you can check them online. And what to expect for 2012? Consolidate the networks, the international networks that we've built. Keep reinventing the movement with new actions, with new manuals. We have developed manuals that you can check in the other links. Keep expanding internationally, nationally, and locally, and achieve results. One of the things we are thinking about on uh, May 15th, or around May, or the things that are being told, it's a, a global strike. I'm, I'm not saying that this will happen. We still have to decide if it will happen or not. But that global strike is going to be a different kind of a strike. Something that we can all do. Something that a housewife can do, an employee can do, someone with a, slow, a small company can do. It has to be a strike from the system we are in. And, and that's about it. Thank you a lot. And I hope you, you got interested about it and uh, want to get more information. Ok, pessoal, uh, eu queria rapidamente apresentar o uh, César Alvarez, que é o moderador desse painel. Ele foi tá preso num voo, ele acabou de chegar uh, e ele é secretário do Ministério das Comunicações e ele vai coordenar o painel a partir de agora. César, por favor. Ok. You've all had your practice, right? So it's time to send a message back to the folks around the world that are watching us right now on live stream. And how does it go? All day, all night. No. All day, all week, Occupy Wall Street. You ready? All day, all week, Occupy Wall Street. The past few days I hear constantly people running around chanting the names of corporations. Can't we do a little bit to chant the name of a popular slogan to change the world? Just a little? All day, all week, occupy Wall Street. All day. 
I'm going to blame the translators on this. All right, moving right along. Uh, my name is Charles Lenchner, and I want to teach you the hand signals. You familiar with this? Do you want to learn the hand signals? Okay, who does not want to learn the hand signals? Okay. Who is against hand signals? All right, no one. This is good. Would anyone like to block hand signals on ethical grounds? No, this is also good. These are very effective tools that allow large numbers of people to cooperate at the same time without getting in each other's way. And it's a perfect metaphor for the social media and the digital networks that we build. They are also excellent tools for getting lots of people to work together without getting in each other's way. And in some ways, you can accept the model of these social media tools as a way for letting everyone find their voice. Everyone can put up a video, they can tweet, they can decide on a hashtag that they want to use. Everybody, it's very democratic. And now we have to take that kind of spirit and move it into the real world together. So this is the Occupy Wall Street digital strategy. You throw everything at the wall and you see what sticks. I can't tell you all the things that have been tried that you've never heard about or that I've never heard about because they didn't work. We don't know about them. What we know are the things that worked. And this attitude of testing everything, this is actually very powerful. There's no one who can say, don't try that, or it will never work, or you don't have permission. It's very powerful. The second thing, and this is part of the same rule, is that we give power to the free agents. And in a normal political or activist campaign, uh, there are a group of people, even if it's everyone, and they very carefully decide, what is the strategy we would like to use? How do we think we should be represented? What is the best message that we have to convey? But in our movement, we are giving power to the free agents, to folks that are not necessarily part of an organization that has discipline over them. And just so you know, there's a lot more free agents out there than there are people that are actively in organizations that are doing something right now. Every single one of you, no matter what your background, can be a free agent in support of the causes you believe in. And your power as free agents is probably greater than the power of all the organizations that are arrayed against you. And that's one of the important lessons. So this is, I'm now going to show you an example of one of the best social media or, or digital efforts to support the movement. This is from a website, we are the 99% on Tumblr. And what you see is a young lady and she's holding a, a note that she, that she hand, hand wrote herself. And lots of people did this. Thousands of people have completed this on a website. She writes, I'm 19 years old and married to a hardworking military man. I have no job despite many applications, and I have not started college. I'm too scared to acquire that much debt, and I have no guarantee of getting a job in this dying economy. I am scared. I am lost. I am pissed. I'm part of the 99%. This emotional message that she has written down, this activates something. It's a story. Human beings respond very powerfully to storytelling, more so than to facts. In addition, that young woman who has written this down, just like in school, you have to copy from the blackboard. And once you've copied it down, spoken it out loud, sent it out on a video on YouTube, the message resonates in you and the people you know and your life like a pebble tossed in a pond. And this act of doing it in public, it touches other people and makes them more likely to do that as well. It's an extremely powerful tool. And yet... This is another website that was developed after the first one, and I, I can tell you, I know this, it was inspired by that first one, which again was very successful. This one is a collaboration between some of the free agents that are part of Occupy Wall Street and some of the more organized institutional people, folks that work with trade unions, uh, organizations that have been doing uh, poor people organizing for many years, and they came together and they said, it's very nice to focus on the protesters, but you can't fix a problem until you fix the blame. Who the hell did this to us? Who are the corporate leaders and politicians that fucked our economy? Well, let's tell them what we think about that. 
So I'm not going to demonstrate the, the website in front of you, but if you click on one of these links, it gives you a list of individuals who are running some of the most evil corporations in the world, and you can send them a letter, and your letter can say, I can't believe you did this to me. I, I, I tried to pay my mortgage, and your bureaucracy was terrible, and you crashed the economy, and this is how I feel about it, and I'm angry at you, Mr. Corporate uh, Leader. This is very powerful. Again, almost 10,000 letters have been sent. And the people behind the website, they searched every single letter. And they found the most representative, good people that could serve as spokespeople for the movement. They elevated their voices. They brought them to protests around the country. They organized letter delivery actions in the real world. And they exemplified bringing together a digital project with real-world activities by organizations and networks of people coming together. And this is, a, is a, 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 the natural evolution of the Occupy Wall Street message, to build on what we have and go further. So what are the advantages of the Occupy digital strategy? A meta brand is like an umbrella. Under this umbrella, you can have many different voices. They don't sound the same. In fact, some of them may disagree, but they're all standing under the umbrella, which means that they're all reinforcing each other's message and helping the movement be stronger. And that is much more powerful than one organization doing the same thing as, um, as was said before. The door is wide open for all. Miley Cyrus, who here knows Miley Cyrus? Who here is a huge fan of Miley Cyrus? Yay! Okay. Miley Cyrus made a video in support of Occupy Wall Street. Everyone was like, what? Miley Cyrus? Occupy? How can this be? But there was no one to tell her not to do it. There was no one to tell her to do it. She thinks it's advantageous to her career to support the movement. That's great. Uh, and it was a very nice video, mostly scenes taken from our live stream account of us protesting. There's no gatekeeping. Anyone can do what they want to. If it sucks, it wasn't us. If it's great, we celebrate it all over the world. Free agents find a home. So one of the reasons why there's so many powerful free agents out there that don't have an organizational home is that the political and economic infrastructure is corrupt and rotten. If you're a good person, if you're creative, if you're passionate, there are good reasons for you not to be plugged into something right now. And Occupy Wall Street has been successful at gathering those people and giving them a home. Finally, we have cooperation without coordination. Coordination is meetings, it's agreements, it's late night phone calls, it's very depressing, it takes a long time, it's highly inefficient. But co cooperation is a little bit different. Cooperation means, hey, you do this and I'll do that. And it's been enabled on a massive scale, which is why you have hundreds of occupations uh, that were in place uh, shortly after Occupy Wall Street began. All right, what are the disadvantages? Because there are disadvantages. One is there's a lot of wasted effort. Like I said, you haven't heard about all the things you haven't heard about, but they may have taken just as much time as the things that you did hear about. We don't have a mechanism to say, hey, don't do that. There's something better over here you should be working on instead. We don't have it. Weak evaluation. If someone does a project and it fails, this could be a very important lesson for everyone else. A failure is as educational as a success. But the news about why that was a, a, a successful failure, it doesn't spread very wide. So we have limited evaluation capacity. The barriers to integration, and here I'm being a little bit of a social media geek. Every website you visit, there's a Facebook button, there's a Twitter button, there's a um, Dig, there's a you know, Reddit, whatever it is. It's very hard for us to have truly integrated media campaigns. They require so many moving pieces that it's, it's, it's difficult for us to do it from the start. Now often it happens as time goes by anyway, but there's definitely an advantage to coming out the door with all channels ready to go. Uh, smaller projects, smaller projects are good. Personally, my project is to change the world. That's a very big project. It requires a much more sophisticated level of integration and coordination. We're not there yet, but we're getting there. Finally, the focus on feeling not impact. You see that photo? This young woman is being brutalized and someone else is taking a picture. Pictures like that generated an outpouring of support and emotion for Occupy Wall Street. And they should. 
what normal person wouldn't be horrified when young people are being beaten up for exercising their free speech rights. However, there's a difference between outrage and organization. Outrage can be very high and organization can be very low. On the other hand, organization can be very high and outrage can be very low. And I think that the message here is that you have to be thinking about a little bit of numbers. How many did we recruit? How many email addresses? How many people came out into the street? How many laws have we been able to pass? You need to think about the ultimate impact of the work that you do every step of the way. We just passed over a list of websites. This is going to be up and I'll, I'll pass around the, uh, the link to the slide share so you can take advantage of them. Um, but I just wanted to end with a nice little shot here of someone kissing the American dollar. Don't kiss American currency. Um, changing the world is more exciting than any computer game. I wanted to leave you with a final thought. I made a calculation based on the number of people here playing computer games for a week that you have used up collectively at least half a million hours shooting things that don't exist. I'd like to point out that if you spend half a million hours trying to make change in your hometown, in your country, in Latin America, in the world, you would probably achieve amazing, dramatic things. The number of people who put Occupy Wall Street or the Arab Spring or the M15 was much smaller than half a million hours. So believe in your potential and get off your seats, get off the internet and make change. Thank you very much. Changing the world is more exciting than any game. I like that. Well, excuse me for not seeing you, Leila. Excuse me for my por meu atraso, um voo cancelado e um voo atrasado. E vou esperar o Charles botar a tradução dele aqui. Can you hear me, Charlie? Changing the world is a good idea. I love that. <laughs> Okay. Charles, vocês, num dia de novembro, lá em Wall Street, tiveram uma visita. Esta visita conversou com vocês e disse algumas coisas que eu gostei também. E eu vou pedir o comentário de vocês e também do Olaf. Foi aquele filósofo esloveno que chama Slavo Zizek. E ele disse uma coisa lá, nessa conversa, o texto dele está na internet. Vocês e nós não nascemos no mundo perfeito. Temos o dever e o direito de pensar num mundo melhor, num mundo alternativa. Talvez ele trabalhasse um pouco com aquela consigna do Fórum Social Mundial, um outro mundo é possível. Mas ele disse também no início do discurso dele, não se apaixonem por vocês mesmos. Eu queria um comentário de vocês sobre essa fala dele lá. Se é que tu lembra, se é que você estava lá. Well, I, I actually wasn't there. I'm hard of hearing, so I'm unable to participate in a large number of activities at Occupy Wall Street. Um, and this personal problem, I have to take this off when I'm speaking, otherwise I get confused. Um, it made me realize that for every action we do, there are large numbers of people who are unable to participate. Maybe some of them are growing older and they can't hear as well or see. Or maybe English is not the language they're most comfortable in. Maybe they have jobs and they don't have time to come to our central square. Maybe they have children to take care of. So in my mind, I'm always thinking about the people whose faces I'm not seeing. Who are the marginalized that are not present in the conversations that we're having? So I feel like the, this lesson from Zizek is very important, not to be in love with our own efforts. The truth is, is that what I'm in love with is something in the future that I can't describe in a perfect way. But I know that with each new person that we're able to bring in and give a voice to the movement, that something magical and beautiful and spiritual is happening. And I feel like it's safe, uh, it's safe for my ego to be in love with that and not to be in love with, uh, with the work that I'm actually doing. Well, I'm, I'm very sorry. You will have to explain me the question because I couldn't hear it through the... Oh, yes. So the, the 
Slavoj Žižek, who spoke in November at Occupy Wall Street, he gave an important lesson. He warned the protesters uh, who were then at the peak of their publicity, don't be in love with yourselves. And he was making that warning, and gentleman wants to know what is our opinion of that statement. Uh, of course, that's one of the important rules about, about the movement. This is not a... Uh, being in love is amazing. We've all been in love, and you are super happy, and you are crazy about it, but it doesn't last for five years. That sensation, that crazy sensation, it lasts for a very short time. This is a long-distance run. This is something that we have to keep working maybe three years, five years, ten years, until we achieve our goals. We make mistakes, it's important to make mistakes, and it's even more important to learn from those mistakes. So, thinking that you can change the world, that's not, that's not just important, but it is real. But falling in love with yourself, well, at least try not to do it for too long, or you might lose focus. Olmo, muitos dizem que um dos muitos antecedentes à, à Praça del Sol foi, por exemplo, aquela manifestação toda por Messant, quando após o atentado, ao, antes das eleições do Zapatero, o governo Asnar tentou atribuir aqueles atentados à bomba no metrô ou na frente de uma estação a UETA, e rapidamente se estabeleceu um enorme circuito de mensagens desmobilizando, dizendo que era mentira, que era um golpe do Asnar para ganhar as eleições. E teria sido uma mudança que levou na última hora a vitória do Zapatero, agora fragorosamente derrotado pelos espanhóis e por vocês também. Depois daquilo, a gente escuta falar maravilhas e barbaridades do papel das mídias sociais e das tecnologias na mobilização. Entre um extremo ou outro, como é que vocês veem isto, o quanto está idealizado ou o quanto está desconstituído? O Charles usou aqui uma frase, né? desvantagens das estratégias digitais. Então eu queria um pouco um comentário sobre vocês, o quanto isto é exagero, o quanto é real, como é que vocês veem o papel das mídias e vocês mesmo nas mídias sociais nesse movimento? Um, well, we've been uh, talking about before, and it's very extreme in the case of Syria, from the what the, what is the the media message controlled by the government is telling you, and what are citizens, what do they think, or what are the the, the information channels that they have in order to distribute a different kind of news. So it's very extreme in the Syria case. We've also seen it in the Spanish case. What is the, the media vision you have for Spain? And what are some things that you have no idea about? When this happens in a, in a very strategic time, uh, as our elections for a political party, this can have very different outcomes. We actually, when we chose May 15th, that was a, uh, a week before our local elections. We knew that that was the right time to act. They are weak at that time. So you should also choose the times when your enemy is facing some difficulties in order to, to move forward and change the message. Change the message from what they are telling you on TV to what you are seeing in the streets. Uh, the, the bombs in, uh, before uh, Zapatero's election, that's also a very extreme example and an extremely sad example. Uh, but unfortunately, that's how sometimes those governments make very bad decisions about uh, the communications that they want to, to provide their citizens. Um, I'm, gonna, I'm just going to say that the, sometimes the phrase, the digital divide, is used to support um, programs that give more people access to the internet, more people access to computers, because they, they can really change people's lives. But sometimes the word digital divide is used inside progressive movements in order to say, don't spend so much time looking at the potential of these things, you know, uh, don't move so fast, pay attention to the people at home who are doing other things. 
And to me, that's, a, that's kind of a cultural conservatism. And the, the metaphor that comes to mind is uh, watching uh, a lovely television show about the Reformation in England. Uh, one person was trying to hand a printed Bible in English to someone else, and that person said, read the Bible? I would like it read to me in Latin in church if you don't mind. And this is what I'm hearing when I hear people say, you know, oh, all of this newfangled social media. It's fine if you don't want to join the information revolution, but don't use that fact as a way to prevent or to, uh, or to try and block the, the massive social transformation that we're in the middle of. It's a losing strategy for every individual and every institution. Instead, you should be asking the question, how do I make it more accessible to more people? How do I get my needs as a community to be working with this change and not against it? You both don't want to make questions or comments for each other? What you said? You both don't think in make questions or arguments about with each other? <laughs> Do we have arguments? Uh, well, there is just one thing. This is not really a question of mine. But, uh, well, it comes to my mind from many friends from Spain. And, uh, and I'd like to, to ask you, uh, uh, in Spain, many people think that we influenced many ways, in many ways, how uh, Occupy Wall Street and Occupy Washington and the camps started in, in the U.S. And there were many people involved. Uh, how do you see it from the other side of the Atlantic? I, I think it's definitely true. There is a... There is a growing number of people that are paying attention and listening to the, to the worldwide movement for dignity that, be, that began with the Arab Spring, but really has roots in you know, all of human history. And the, uh, the networks that were paying close attention to what was happening were being picked up in various quarters. One of them was by Adbusters Magazine, which is a, excuse me, a wonderful resource for listening carefully to some of the cultural trends that aren't reaching the mass media. So it's true that many Americans may have noticed that there was massive protests in Spain, but we also had activists that were coming from Spain to New York and other cities talking about what they witnessed and saying, listen, there's a lot of potential here. We could be joining in this. We could be figuring out how to make this example more American. Maybe in the beginning, only a small number of people were participating in that conversation, but today you have hundreds of thousands of people sort of deeply engaged in that conversation. I will say one, one of the differences uh, for me is that uh, I feel very friendly towards many of the old institutions like trade unions or established NGOs working with the Occupy Wall Street. Um, and I know that in the movement there are other voices that are very concerned about the problem of co-optation. And I wonder if this is an issue also in Spain. Uh, not really with uh, NGOs. And uh, it, uh, we might have had some problems with uh, political parties and trade unions. Uh, but as I said before, the most important thing, if you, if you want to enter the movement in Spain, is to take away your hat. If you are participating in another organization, that doesn't matter as long as you are participating as a human being. So if you are participating as uh, an NGO and want to impose the views of that NGO or the structure of that NGO, that will not work in, of mo in our movement. If you want to collaborate with, this, with the DNA that we have created as a person and uh, maybe transmit that message to the NGO, then that, that's fantastic. And anyone, everyone is welcome. Bankers and politicians too. But as long as they, they are not, well, selling out the, their product. Pessoal da organização está me avisando que vamos abrir o microfone para quem quiser perguntar, falar. É esta moça aqui. Someone of them. Bom, meu nome é Amanda, eu sou daqui de São Paulo. É, inspirado no companheiro de Wall Street, eu queria perguntar quantas pessoas aqui sabiam que a gente teve uma acampada em São Paulo? 
Porque no dia 15 de outubro, nós acampamos aqui em São Paulo por 53 dias. E aí a minha pergunta vai no sentido de... Eu conversei com outras pessoas de outras ocupações, de outras acampadas, e eu queria saber para vocês, para onde isso vai agora? Porque muitas pessoas que participaram do processo de acampadas são pessoas que não se mobilizavam politicamente antes. Então eu quero saber como organizar isso agora e não se perder nesse tudo que é sólido desmancha no ar. E outra pergunta que eu queria fazer também no sentido de como se organizar, o que vocês acham sobre... Existe uma ferramenta espanhola chamada N-1, que a frase da entrada é as ferramentas do amo jamais derrubarão o amo. E eu queria saber para vocês o que, que é se organizar via Facebook. Não estou falando de divulgação, que eu apoio, mas por onde a gente vai se organizar por ferramentas nossas? So, first of all, I want to thank you. Um, when we held our, our events in, in, in September, there was definitely a feeling that we were doing it in solidarity with the world and not just with the issues in our own country. We recognize the importance of the Wall Street Financial Center in issues that are taking place around the globe. So, you know, I'm really happy we could meet finally uh, and, and participate in this way. I'll say that, that trying to look to the protesters in New York City for inspiration about political direction would be a mistake. We ourselves don't see our, we don't have this image that we are leading and others should follow. We've gone through a process where the people involved in Occupy are from across the United States, across North America, and across the world. We have many networks of collaboration, and it, probably the language barrier might make it more difficult to work with some of our uh, Brazilian colleagues, but we should try and overcome that and figure out what's next. I know that there's a, a lot of conversation about activities in the springtime. Uh, we're planning a, a May 1st uh, set of activities in the U.S. There's a May 15th worldwide set of activities that we are looking at very closely and in solidarity with. When it comes to the use of tools, so I, I work with the uh, technical operations group of Occupy Wall Street. We are very focused on tools and we have a lot of creative differences uh, uh, a lot of different energies in the movement. I will say I, I'm not quite as interested in haggling over which tool is good and which is bad. What I would ask for is to really think about, about numbers, really think about what you're accomplishing. Over the course of Occupy Wall Street, many people showed up, said hello, and went away. And we don't know who they are because we didn't ask them. We didn't ask them to give a cell number or an email address. We didn't have a system to put it in the computer so we can email them in the future. We didn't have a system to make sure that an individual in the street was connected to a Facebook group. And what that means is that when we want to relay our message for the springtime, we are relying on uh, methods of communication that are less intimate and less personal than email and social media. For me, this is a loss. So while I don't necessarily care about what tools we use to overcome that, I definitely want to have as much personal interaction with as many of our supporters as possible. And there's a lot of things that we didn't do um, as well as we could have the first time around. Uh, I'm, I'm very glad uh, to hear about the, the, the October 15 demonstrations. And then you can check on all, all the links that, that, that we have with uh, all the videos uh, about the tools. It is true that when there is a like this kind of social explosions that consumes a lot of energy and that consumes it might consume more energy than the energy is produced so that system is not sustainable and it collapses we have to look for systems that are sustainable that means that you need less energy to put into the system than the one that, that it consumes uh, the, the tools that we use in order to keep in touch with all of that, you can, you can check out N-1, and you have it in the presentation links. We have virtual poll that we use for voting. That's also there. Facebook groups, we are trying to get out of Facebook, but it's hard because it's convenient for many people, and many people are hooked up into Facebook to make decisions. We use pirate pads for collaborative work uh, writing. And uh, 
and then the Twitter networks and all the, the, the web networks. If you centralize everything into a mailing list or, well, and then there are, you have news. You have to be able to generate news. We have local and national news and then international news. Local and national news, you can have them in Toma Los Barrios, Toma La Plaza. International news, you have them in Take The Square, uh, .net. Uh, but anyway, take a look at the presentation. I just tweeted it. My, my tweet is Olmo Galvez. And, and the presentation, it's, it's well, uh, then this presentation is just to get you more interested. Uh, we can talk later, but you have to be able to learn by yourself what are the things that work here to be able to retain the knowledge and to be able to generate a system that consumes less energy than produces afterwards. But we can talk about it later. Uh, this is another thing, this movement, you are not going to learn everything right now. I hope you, either you are introduced already or you, uh, you are just getting some information that might interest you. And then you start going deeper and deeper and deeper in the movement to see what things are going on. So even though it's open for everyone, the barriers of entrance, the only one, it's yourself. It's yourself. You have to be motivated enough to keep learning and to look for that information. And then you will, you will contribute. Uh, boa tarde a todos. Muito obrigado por esses ensinamentos incríveis que vocês estão nos trazendo hoje. Uh, eu sou professor da, da Universidade do Vale do Rio dos Sinos, no Rio Grande do Sul, no curso de Comunicação Digital. Meu nome é Hélio Paz e a gente trabalha com, com ciberativismo, a gente faz pesquisa sobre isso. Né? E lá em Porto Alegre, no Rio Grande do Sul, na nossa capital, no dia em que nós ocupamos, ali, o 15 de outubro, a gente teve um problema sério, que foi o seguinte, os movimentos todos eram partidarizados, quase todos, inclusive os estudantis. Diziam que não, tem o um movimento juntos.org, mas eles são partidarizados sim. Né? E aí... Uh, o pessoal da OAB, que é a Organização dos Advogados do Brasil, que é uma instituição vinculada ao conservadorismo à direita, uh, levou, levou um, um caminhão com faixas, etc. E os estudantes, uh, embora eles estivessem contra os partidos, pediram para o pessoal de partido de, uh, abaixar suas bandeiras ou não levantar as bandeiras, eles também eram partidarizados. E, então o pessoal todo foi... A, a, a marcha demorou para sair de um parque até a praça onde, ela se estabelece, onde se estabeleceu o acampamento, até o pessoal decidir, bom, vai ou não vai com bandeiras. E claro, uh, o pessoal abaixou as bandeiras, mas no meio da passeata teve gente que levantou, claro. Não houve brigas, não houve violência em função disso. Mas eu acho que o movimento perdeu credibilidade. O tempo também da acampada foi relativamente curto. E a OAB tinha uma influência muito forte na mídia corporativa local. Né? O grupo RBS, que é afiliado à Rede Globo, que detém 95% da, de, de alcance televisivo por todo o território brasileiro. No Rio Grande do Sul, eles dominam isso. Né? Então, a OAB, patrocinadores graúdos de políticos e da mídia, conseguiu fazer com que eles tomassem para si, com, eles passassem para a opinião pública a imagem de que eles é que tinham começado um movimento, uma marcha contra a corrupção. Mas, na verdade, a corrupção contra a qual eles lutavam era a corrupção apenas do partido que está no governo, que é, uh, que, que é um partido no qual eles, eles fazem oposição. Né? E, ao mesmo tempo, o pessoal partidarizado que lutava contra a corrupção, lutava contra a corrupção que ocorre em outros estados, como aqui em São Paulo, na capital e no estado, que é oposição ao governo federal, oposição ao governo lá do Rio Grande do Sul também. Então, não houve um alcance muito grande. Né? Normalmente, as mobilizações lá ocorrem Uh, muito em função de partidos e sindicatos. E a maioria das pessoas uh, se sente dissociada disso. Tem aquele problema também de quem ocupa a rua, normalmente é desocupado, é vagabundo, não tem o que fazer, e está atrapalhando o trânsito, está interrompendo o fluxo dos carros. Né? Então, uh, é muito difícil mobilizar. O Brasil veio de uma ditadura militar de 24 anos e depois assumiu... Uh, um governo liberal que começou a privatizar o país e hoje todo o pessoal grande parte do pessoal que hoje atua nesse governo que supostamente foi eleito como sendo de esquerda 
uh, virou como democratas e republicanos nos Estados Unidos, entende? A ideologia é praticamente a mesma, alguns defendem só o capital e outros defendem aqueles que financiam a sua campanha. É praticamente a mesma coisa. Então eu pergunto a vocês o seguinte, uh, diante de um quadro desses que é bastante complexo, apesar de não haver aqui a violência que se encontrou na, se, que houve na Síria, por exemplo, depois lá em Wall Street também para desocupar a praça, como a gente poderia fazer? Thanks a lot. It's, uh, the, the, your views were very very important, and in many ways it's it's important to talk about these things. This is important for this process. You have to get it out. Other people will listen. And the importance uh, how to solve these problems. What I what I was talking about in this presentation that was just that was a beautiful story. That was a perfect story. That everything went well. That there were no people from all kinds of parties inside. That th 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 there were some spies from everywhere. Uh, the media trying to destroy the movement in many ways, and they actually did for a large chunk of population. So, one important thing is, and if I have one message for you, that one way to change the world is turn off your TV. I mean, throw your TV away and, and tell everyone you know to get rid of your TV. TV is not good. It's not good for you, it's not good for society. The second one is, uh, How to solve those issues? Well, one of the lessons we have is that the people that are conspiring against the movement and are within the movement, those people normally do not last. It's hard for them to last. It's, I, I don't know how it's, it's going on, but if you are not in love with it, if you don't really feel it, then it's very hard to, for someone to continue. And, And the other problems that, that you are having, then you have to solve them to yourselves. And you will have to do it as a group, as a group of people collaborating. Uh, I'm just going to say there's a real danger in looking at a, a, a political process or moment in another country, another part of the world, and you're inspired by it, you want to participate, so you try to follow a little bit on a very short time frame how they did it. But the local conditions here might be different and might make that kind of thing very hard to accomplish. One of the advantages that the, the Spanish and the, and the uh, Egyptians and the Americans had is when they began, they didn't have as much press attention. So you could have a group of people that are showing dedication with their bodies day after day, building social capital amongst themselves as the authentic leaders and representatives of a larger movement. That makes it very hard for someone to come in on the second week or the second month and say, no, actually it's us and we're raising our flags. It doesn't work. But if you try and do it very quickly, someone else with more institutional power can find ways of screwing with you uh, similar to what you described. But the other comment I wanted to say is, it sounds like an awful lot of people where you're, you're coming from are mobilized politically whether in opposition or in support or some strange combination. I wish in the United States more people were politically mobilized. I think disengagement from current events and from civil society is a huge problem. And what you described is a lot of people are involved, but you would like to persuade them to be involved in different ways. So I would sort of ask the classic uh, communicator's question. Who are you trying to reach? How are you going to find them? And what material do you have so compelling that would cause them to change their behavior? And you can do research on what the answers are and then go out and carry out your revolution. But um, if you show up on the square without having answered those questions in advance, you do run a risk that another force will out-organize you. Well, the board is telling us that our time is finishing. So the last three questions all together, please. Your memory. I started one of these three questions. Also, this same Cizek said at that moment at Wall Street, don't forget the day of tomorrow. The normally day is tomorrow, not today. 
Olá, boa tarde. Agradecer muito a oportunidade dessa conversa. Me ouve? Boa tarde. É, são duas questões que eu vou tentar colocar de um jeito muito rápido, porque eu acho que são muito interessantes de ouvir um comentário por parte de vocês que estão à frente dos movimentos, dessa nova movimentação política no mundo. Bom, recentemente a gente viveu uma movimentação mundial, primordialmente pela rede, é, contra a aprovação da lei americana do Stop and Open Piracy Act, a, so, a nossa sopa. E também, eu, nessa, nessa perspectiva, a gente também observou ao longo desses últimos tempos um contágio da experiência do, dos, dos acampamentos, das ocupações, dos ocupis, no mundo inteiro. Né? É, eu queria pedir um comentário de vocês uma perspectiva bem simples. Se, o que, que vocês acham que está acontecendo no mundo? Será que a gente pode supor a criação de uma esfera pública transnacional para o, para o exercício da política? Ou, se não, né, como é que vocês veem essa movimentação coletiva mundial contagiante sobre vários temas políticos de hoje em dia. A segunda pergunta é, é simples, é porque eu ouvi alguns debates sobre o Occupy Wall Street e uma pessoa trouxe uma ideia muito nova que nenhum de nós conhecia nesse debate, de, assim, desfavorecendo um pouco a importância da articulação da ação política na mídia, através das ferramentas, da internet, etc. e tal, dizendo que o movimento do Occupy Wall Street teve força, de fato, quando o sindicato foi à rua. Então, eu gostaria de ouvir um comentário sobre isso também como contraponto. Obrigada. Eu, eu vou pedir o um máximo de concisão para as próximas perguntas. More two questions, ok? Uh, well, uh, uh, I'll go very fast uh, about PIPA and ACTA. Obviously, we, we are against it, and that's uh, obvious. And why? Because we, as humans, we shape technology, and also technology shape us. So technology also shape the way we collaborate. Having a free, open internet, that's very important towards a free, open society. That will bring more justice to all of us. The second one, was uh, about the Occupy Wall Street and trade unions. Uh, when we say that we are uh, not happy with the Spanish trade unions, we are not saying that that works the same in every country. So that he should answer that. In Spain, we, uh, we are very unhappy with the two main trade unions that we have. Um, I'll just say that without the mobilization of Occupy Wall Street, the world the world's people would probably not have defeated SOPA and PIPA. This movement represents a kind of a wind, and if you are trying to stop something or promote something and you have a good sail to catch the wind, then you can do a lot of good or prevent a lot of bad. But you should remember that our opposition, the 1% the that has money and lobbyists and, and connections, they have tremendous experience in lasting for a long time and coming back again and again. They have a system in which not only can they fight us every day, but it's sustainable. They're able to make a good living fighting us day after day. So we should be giving a little bit of thought to what would make our opposition to them sustainable as well, in our own lives sustainable, uh, economically sustainable, uh, uh, looking at cooperative ways of organizing how we meet our needs so that we can continue to do this thinking in a very serious way about how we can get along as activists in ways that always make us feel happier with each passing day to be in community and not more frustrated and irritated with each passing day. So we have to give this uh, a little bit of thought. With regard to the unions, in New York City, the first union that joined us was the Transport Workers Union Local 100. And they joined us uh, in the shadow of a contract of theirs that was expiring. They understood immediately that if our movement would grow, 
then their ability to bargain for uh, wages and for protections would increase as well. They were the first, but they weren't the last. In a fairly short amount of time, about three weeks, locals and then national and then the trade union federation all jumped on board to support Occupy Wall Street. Now this partnership, this relationship is not always smooth because their institutions are much more willing to come to a deal with the, the power that exists in order to win benefits for their members. But we are tremendously popular among the grassroots of uh, unions. And unions, the 14 million people that are members of unions in America, represent the most democratic, grassroots, organized force in the United States. And if they don't always do the things that we would like, it's probably a reflection to a great extent of the politics of their members. So I would just say uh, our experience has been largely positive, this is my opinion, but it can be more positive, and I'm also a member of a labor organizing committee as part of Occupy Wall Street that is trying to organize in the unions on behalf of Occupy, but organize in Occupy to spread the message of organized labor. I think there's a good, a good cross-fertilization that is taking place. Eu vou agradecer em nome de meu nome, em nome de todos vocês, contando uma rápida história que este mesmo Slalo falou lá em Wall Street. Ele contou uma piada. Os trabalhadores da antiga Alemanha iam trabalhar na Sibéria, lugar terrível. E disse ele, eu vou contar para vocês, tudo que eu escrever em linha, em cor azul, é porque é verdade. Tudo que eu escrever em tinta vermelha é porque é mentira. E mandou a primeira carta. Isso aqui é uma maravilha, eu estou ganhando um belo salário, as férias são tremendas, o cinema é ótimo, a televisão é boa, eu tenho uma internet de 10, gig, 10 mega, mas só tem um problema, não tem tinta vermelha. Então vocês são a nossa tinta vermelha, muito obrigado, e até 15 de maio em The Global Strike Citizens. Obrigado.